is Dr. Randy Blazak. He is a professor of sociology on the faculty of the University of Oregon, co-chair, or excuse me, the chair of the Oregon Coalition Against Hate Crimes. Uh, OregonCAHC.org is that website. His, uh, his Twitter handle is uh, uh, R Blazak, B-L-A-Z-A-K. Uh, Dr. Blazak, welcome to the program. Hey, it's good to be on it. I've long time listener, first time caller. Well, thank, thank you. It's great to have you with us. Um, I, I, I was reading your piece from literally two years ago, from 2015. Uh, you, you point out that you got your PhD from Emory University in 95 after studying several years of ethnographic field studies of white supremacist groups. You've, you're widely published in this area. You're one of the world's leading experts, I would say, or at least the country's leading experts. On, on white uh, white supremacists, and and in 2015, the the title of your piece, you're a prophet, was Donald Trump is the new face of white supremacy. Yeah, do you still feel that way? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's a little surprising, I think, to many of us how quickly this all came about. But when I first was listening to his speeches uh, when he announced he was running and his first sort of discussion about building the wall and, you know, global warming as a Chinese hoax. It just sounded so much like the rhetoric that I would hear at Klan rallies while I was doing my research or the things that skinheads would say about the world. And it was almost cribbed word for word in terms of the blaming of the victim or these conspiracy theories or the white man is on the way out and we have to bring America back. This whole make America great again thing is this push back to this mythical past of the straight white male when he was unchallenged by civil rights legislation and uh, Whoopi Goldberg. So the, um, the pace at which that has accelerated is frightening because I think two years ago, a lot of us thought he was just going to be, you know, a kind of side note of our political history and end up with a, a good TV show out of it. And in fact, now he's in the White House. And the, the frightening part is that the people who knew that rhetoric and we're listening to them are now spilling into the streets and we're seeing the you know the end result of all that type of talk now in charlottesville and in seattle and all around the country including here in portland what are the dimensions of the clan slash nazi slash uh, more generic white uh, supremacist uh groups and, and individuals, for that matter. What are the dimensions of this in the United States? It's, it's always something that's hard to measure. Even when the Klan was an organized group that had a um, set membership, and you would have people who are literally card-carrying members of the Klan, it was hard to tell because there's the shadow membership that's involved. And so one of the things that's happened over the last 20 years, and really the last 10 years, it's been these groups have moved online, so you don't have to be a formal member of a group. Dylan Roof, uh, the Charleston shooter, was never a member of a formal group. And so it's hard to gauge. And so in, in a weird way, uh, the stuff that's been happening over the last year with the alt-right has been useful because instead of being on these websites on Reddit and 4chan, they're now out and we can actually count them and they're they're marching with their torches and we can take their pictures. So you get a little bit of a better idea of the scope of it, but it's still really hard to measure. We do know um, from public uh, public attitude surveys that there is a sort of a, a consistent 20 percent of people who are fellow travelers with this ideology of white people, believe, of white people who believe that sort of their picture of America is in jeopardy. Uh, and you are opposed to civil rights laws that are opposed to gay rights. And so that, that's the sort of constant that's, thing. That's, the question is how much you can fan the people who are on the margins of that. Right. Uh, we had John Dean on. Uh, John Dean's been on this program many times. He wrote a book called Conservatives Without a Conscience that was based on a book, a previous book by another author called The Authoritarians. And he posited that about 20 percent of the population has authoritarian tendencies, most of them authoritarian followers as opposed to authoritarian leaders. And uh, the followers are looking for an authoritarian leader. Um, is there a lot of overlap between those two 20 percents? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think what we see, and this is based not only on my research, but the research of others, is that there are people that have a hard time managing all the change that's happening in this country. I mean, if we think about the last 50 years and even the last 10 years, there's a huge demographic change. There's a huge change with regards to gender and sexual identity. There's a huge economic change. You know, people are working at Walmart instead of General Motors. I mean, all this change has been happening fairly quickly. And so the 
people who are going to be able to explain that change to those people who feel sort of left out by it and alienated by it are going to win the day. And if it was, you know, 1968, it might have been Students for Democratic Society or somebody like that. But, you know, for the last 20 years, the, the right wing has had the analysis that it's globalization and then a little bit darker. You know, it's this conspiracy theory and a little bit darker from that. It's this conspiracy theory about a global Jewish elite that wants to displace white Christian men with feminism and homosexuality and hip hop music and all these other tropes that are hauled out to show that the white man isn't in power anymore. And so that's the, that's the thing that pulls those people in who are authoritarian following, who are looking for an analysis, that's step one, and then are looking for what to do about it, that's step two. And so these alt-right demonstrations are part of step two. Right. So I'm, I'm interested in solutions. If I could very quickly tell you a couple of stories out of my own life. Um, uh, about, you know, how about white people waking up to race. Um, my father grew up in Uwego, Michigan, a, a pretty much all white rural town in northern Michigan, uh, mostly a Norwegian community. His his father and mother were Norwegian immigrants. And um, as a kid, I used to spend summers up there and with my cousins. My cousins weren't particularly racist, but some of the people that they hung out with were. I mean, this was where the earliest my some of my earliest memories of white people using the n-word just liberally uh came from there my father so my father grew up in that he went off to world war ii to the japanese uh, what do you call it and when he uh, you know to the uh to the occupation where he served with black people it was probably the first time in his life he'd ever encountered black people and it, he when when any of my friends would say anything would be marginally racist my father would come down on them like a ton of bricks the, the, the white girl who lived next door to us wanted to marry a black man. Her parents literally disowned her, and my father walked her down the aisle in that wedding. He became the most, you know, he, it just flipped him upside down. My wife went through, back in the 60s in, in East Lansing, Michigan, through these uh, uh, black awareness classes and read Cry the Beloved Country and the autobiography of Malcolm X and whatnot. Uh, how you know it seems like these these are waking up experiences for white people how do we more broadly generalize generalize this how do we how do we get out of this where do we go from here well part of it is exactly what you're talking about which is dealing with the issue of ignorance it, ignorant people aren't bad or evil they're just uneducated i mean my grandmother never met a muslim that she knew about and said some horrible things after 9 11 and i said grandma come with me and let's talk to a muslim and it changed her whole view just by having that first person contact. So in a similar story that you're telling, a lot of it is breaking out of our bubbles and meeting people, meeting refugees and meeting gay people and, you know, getting to know people as human beings as opposed to stereotypes or memes on Facebook. So that's the first step. The second step is giving people the tools to handle all this change, to understand it so they don't immediately go into the sort of simplistic black and white world that we're you know, being attacked. I mean, these guys literally that were marching in Virginia were saying, you know, the, the white man is losing America. And if you don't understand the history of America in terms of the, the patchwork of cultures and immigrant groups and all the people that have participated in, in America, including the slaves, that is a very resonant claim that, you know, somehow this picture of history that I've been taught is going away. And if I don't do something now, it's going to be unrecognizable. Well, that person needs to be educated a little bit on the history as well and, and given some skills by which to manage that change. Uh, and so that's a lot of the work we do through the coalition. It's trying to find resources. There's an amazing group now, of former white supremacists, people who used to be members of skinhead groups and Klan groups. They're called Life After Hate. And they do amazing work de-radicalizing other right-wing extremists by talking about how they fell into it, the thinking errors they made, the behavioral errors they made, and how their life is better now that they got out of it. They're a wonderful resource. Um, we're using them in the Islamic world in Europe, and we're starting to use them in the white supremacist. What's the name of that group? I'd love to get somebody on, on on the show as a guest. Yeah, there's some great folks. They're called Life After Hate. Uh, okay, cool. We'll check it out. There are they can really provide a testimony about the appeal of that world, especially to young men, and what it took to get out of it, and the incredible perspective and insight that you have once you're on the outside looking back inward at it. Do you think that having a... And, and can I just say, and can I just say they were given a $400,000 grant by the Obama administration in January that was rescinded by the Trump administration last month. So I just want to throw that in Oh, there. sweet Jesus. Yeah, so they're worth seeking out and supporting because they really need help to do the work that they're doing. 
Uh, that's so, yeah. that. That is that's obscene. Um, yeah. Wow. Do you think that yeah. having a president who has, uh, you know, as you, you referred to him two years ago, the Nazi dream date, uh, who's a, 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 apparently a white nationalist, certainly has surrounded himself with at least three prominent ones in the White House. Um, and uh, even today, when they finally, after three days, came out with a carefully scripted paragraph uh, condemning Nazis, never used the word terrorism or white terrorism and certainly would never say white Christian terrorism. This is the guy who for eight years was screaming that Obama would not say radical Islamic terrorism. Do you think that that is helping or hurting? Uh, you know, obviously the white nationalists, these these Nazis, they think that they've got their guy in the White House. But for the broader dialogue, is this helping wake up America or is this throwing us back? Is this like a, a new version of birth of a nation? Yeah, I mean, I think from the work that I do, with the white supremacists, just spending time in their chat rooms and their discussion forums, they know that sometimes he has to sort of play to the political mainstream and, you know, say Happy Hanukkah in December or something like that. But he is speaking their language. He's carrying their cause. I mean, I don't know what's in Trump's mind or heart. He just seems kind of dumb to me. Like he, he doesn't really know what's happening. But the, um, the, the, that group definitely sees him as their last best chance. The, wider population including a lot of the people that voted for him also are angry about affirmative action they're angry about civil rights they're angry about immigration uh and they don't have the essentially the tools to make sense of what's going on because the only people that's explaining to them are these folks on the right who say you know it's the illegal immigrant who wants to rape your daughter that's the problem so um so it's it's, e it's easy in that sense to pull those people over to this extremist side. And what we're seeing, and I, mean, I think you are, are, are probably one of the best voices on this, is that the, the dialogue, the political discourse is just inching, inching farther and farther to the right to a point where, you know, John McCain is now a liberal and the fascists are now sort of have a stake in mainstream right. political discourse. Dr. Dr. Blazik, we're, we're out of time, but thank you. So hang on just a second. Yes is the Tom Hartman Program. Dr. Rand Randy Blazik, uh, sociology professor at University of Oregon, Oregon, C-A-H-C dot org. Thank you, sir.